Hello, I'm Bob the Booker and welcome back to my channel. Uh, today I wanted to talk about a novel that has got a little bit of buzz recently. Well, I say a little bit of buzz. It was always guaranteed to have quite a bit of buzz uh, because it is by uh, Kazuo Ishiguro, um, who is a very well-known and beloved author in many, many ways. Recently won the Nobel Prize for Literature um, and so this is his first book since winning that prize. And I mean, kind of should start probably at the beginning with two quick disclaimers. Firstly, uh, that this will most likely, well, almost definitely contain a lot of spoilers for uh, Clara and the Sun, his most recent book, uh, but also just a kind of a heads up in advance that I am a massive fan of Ishiguro anyway, and so there is a very strong likelihood that, you know, uh, that will influence my love of the book and kind of love of other bits. Um, about him. But yes, as you may then be able to tell, I adored this. So, uh, to start with this book itself, so Clara and the Sun um, in some ways picks up from, uh, picks up where a book like Never Let Me Go left off um, in terms of it explores some of the same themes, which is um, around the idea of in artificial intelligence, of a kind of future time when technology might be there to replace some aspects of humankind. Um, and it's, you know, obviously that's a a sort of theme and sometimes a trope that's used in so many sort of different bits of fiction. Um, you know, you see it a lot in kind of ideas around science fiction and, and works that kind of are concerned with science fiction. Um, and it's, you know, it's kind of one of those things that, especially kind of certain periods of time, has been a major preoccupation of so many, um, so many authors and so many thinkers and so many people just generally, um, you know, particularly with this kind of the sort of surge of when, you know, when robots first started being kind of manufactured, there were all these kind of concerns about uh, them taking over and, you know, so many horror and sci-fi films have kind of been around that. So with that in mind, Clara and the Sun kind of seems to come into that, um, at, you know, following on from some of those ideas. But for me, there's just so much that's really special about this book that even though, you know, artificial intelligence, robots, you know, the kind of whole sort of discussion around like robots and souls and, you know, what makes a human, what makes a robot. In some ways that a lot of that conversation has been done to death. And I think it's really quite striking for me that um, Ishiguro still manages to make something so powerful and interesting and beautiful from this book. Um, and with that idea, despite, you know, the sheer amount of art and kind of creative things that have my hair is really ridiculous. Uh, the sheer amount of art and creative things that have come out around this idea. Um, and so, with that in mind, the whole story is, it starts from the, this idea of the AFs, these people who are artificial friends, and they are essentially um, uh, robots that kind of fulfill a sort of childhood friend kind of role. Um, so that is, you know, throughout the book we get little hints of it um, about, you know, sometimes this is used for children who are quite ill. Um, this is maybe also, you know, used for children who are friendless um, or, you know, maybe have problems making friends or who are isolated in other ways. Um, and we meet um, quite early on uh, the character of Josie, who in many ways falls under sort of many of these, um, those things. She is a young girl, well, sort of a teenager, a teenage girl who um, it lives quite remotely. Um, she, we find out sort of later as things go, lost a sister at one point, and um, she is, uh, her, her kind of illness also means that, you know, tied in with her being remote means that she just kind of can't really go out and do much. And we're given a bit of an insight into this world. Um, I think actually what's quite clever about this book for me is that um, Ishiguro doesn't go down the, the line of, I'm going to tell you exactly what's different about this fun, exciting, new, different world. Um, instead, lots of that is kind of given by inference. So, for example, it's very rare that a character will kind of give us the full exposition moment, which can, you know, has been an issue I've had with uh, some books before. Sometimes, particularly some sci-fi books, I found it quite tricky when there is a lot of exposition to kind of create a world. Um, you know, kind of like, oh, this is, how, I don't know, I'm doing that voice. But, you know, here's how this world works. We've got, you know, all of these things and it, society is organised in this way. I think what's really successful and clever about this book is how we don't get all of that at once. Um, a lot of it is strip fed and even by the end of the book, maybe, I, I don't know if I was just being a stupid reader in some ways, but uh, by the end of the book, there were sort of some moments where I was like, I actually don't know fully what this idea means, <laughs> or I don't quite know how this thing functions in the world. I don't necessarily need to, uh, to know it in, in full detail. I think that's the point. Um, but 
it, you know, it's interesting how some of those things are purposely left a little bit more open so that we can focus instead on the, the storytelling at the heart of it. And so we have Josie and we are told quite early on that, you know, these characters, um, that we kind of know there's something a little bit special about Josie, um, not only because of her sort of illness, but there's, there are kind of constant references to how other children have been, um, have kind of gone somewhere else. There's something else that's been done to them and they've been lifted and we're not quite sure what that is for a large part of the book. Um, and it isn't necessarily a big jumpy, you know, change, changing the whole theme, theme of the novel kind of thing. But we do later find out that, you know, some of those characters, you know, a child being lifted is partly to do with their genetic makeup and how um, there's sort of some genetic tampering going on to kind of boost some of these kids. And so essentially a character like Josie is a very standard human who has not had any upgrades or, or whatever else. Um, and that that is actually explored in quite an interesting way in the book because it feels almost quite class-based as well. You know, you've got some characters who um, whose families can afford to kind of lift them and they get into the better schools and, and the cycle continues. Um, so some really kind of interesting kind of background kind of commentaries coming in there from Ishiguro. But um, Clara, sorry, six minutes in and I still haven't really even gone into what the, the actual book's fully about. So there are these artificial friends and Clara is one of them. Um, and the whole aspect and idea of the sun in this is that there is some degree of sort of solar powered nature to these, uh, these sort of these AFs, these artificial friends. Um, and so we start in this really beautiful um, way that I just kind of hooked me really early on, which was um, this, this shop that sells these artificial friends. Um, and Clara is one and she is very excited when she is put out in the front window, not only because that means she gets more sun on her, which kind of really energizes her and sort of builds her back up. Um, and we're not even really told too much about what she looks like, apart from that she's maybe looks a little bit French at some point. Um, but she sat there out in the window and she sees it as her duty to really sell um, herself. You know, she she wants to kind of do a good job so that her owner, or the, the, the shopkeeper can sell her um, and kind of, you know, keep this sort of business sort of going. Um, and so she sees that as very much her duty. So she's not only excited to be out in, in the front to kind of, to, to kind of do this duty to capture as much sun as she can to kind of really kind of re-energize herself, but also she's incredibly curious and she spends a lot of time looking out of the window, really getting a sense of the world around her. We're told very early on she's very curious, she's very observant, she's very clever, um, and in some ways slightly cleverer than a few of the other robots around her. So um, even though there are kind of upgraded robots that we find out about later, which is a really interesting thing because both children and uh, robots are almost a bit worried about being outdone by updated versions of themselves, you know, with the lifted children and, and what have you. Um, but Clara is sort of seen as this really clever character and th those observations make her feel at times, uh, not, I wouldn't say necessarily human, but she definitely starts having a few more traits in common with some of the humans. She's slightly more useful to some of the humans because she sees things that other people don't. And she starts to kind of look out on the world around her and she follows this. There are th there's these really beautiful moments of watching how she interprets the world. So she watches um, a beggar um, and, it's, and his dog and she sort of thinks that various things have happened. She thinks that the sun has blessed him. Um, she thinks that other sort of things have happened. And this is quite an interesting foreshadowing where we start seeing her relationship to the sun, hence the title of the book, <laughs> Clara and the Sun. Um, and um, what's so clever about this is that is all done so subtly. This is very Ishiguro, I think, from books I've read of his before, where something like this is sort of introduced quite subtly. Um, you know, we, we know that she has a relationship with the sun in some form. We know that she has sort of certain beliefs and that kind of comes out a lot later and has a, a bigger role. So eventually, lots of things kind of happen, but she eventually ends up with Josie and is finally a homed robot. And uh, there are these quite funny moments where she has sort of tussles almost with this housekeeper because uh, I think she's called Melania Housekeeper, um, which is great as well, because actually I thought that was a fun commentary on the fact that the housekeeper even is almost given a robotic kind of name. Uh, but the, the housekeeper and the robot sort of disagree with each other. The housekeeper is annoyed that the robot's always in the way, but the robot is also kind of confused because there are some tasks that the housekeeper's doing that the robot kind of thinks that they, they could maybe help with um, to be of, you know, of maximum service. So uh, this little, um, you know, we, we kind of have Clara and she is 
um, she learns more and more, but we we start getting a lot of kind of backstory about this family and we start understanding a lot more about what's going on. We learn that Josie is incredibly ill and is quite likely to die. We learn that her sister Sarah died at quite a young age. And then we also learn that there was at one point a doll version of Sarah. And this obviously starts setting up something that we start wondering about. You know, why was this family so keen uh, to have of someone there with Josie apart from you know to support her we start kind of getting a sense that maybe Clara is either replacing the daughter um, who died um, or as we then find out through a few kind of moments to potentially replace Josie after she dies and there's this really wonderfully brutal aspect of the language here because um, it's it feels quite cold when they talk about uh, um, Clara continuing Josie and you know so, so Clara for example is, is made to imitate her walk to imitate Josie's walk and she's made to imitate kind of things that she would say to the mother on this little trip and it starts kind of creating this really weird balance where Josie herself is quite unhappy about having this robot around um, uh, or kind of is a bit confused about her because she sort of start, start, suddenly starts wondering if she's being kind of replaced or whether her mother likes the robot more or, or anything like that, uh, the artificial friend more. Um, and it's a really interesting thing because essentially Clara is just sort of thrown into a mini family drama and she, you know, with her very logical observations, can't necessarily make sense about a lot of what's happening. However, for me, what tips this novel over the top from just sort of being, you know, a a well done sort of science fiction y, uh, you know, sort of literary fiction kind of crossover thing is the the way that Shigeru somehow manages to make us just fall in love with Clara and have so much um so much faith and love for her and 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 kind of warmth towards her even though she's you know one of the only non-human characters in the book um and for me this kind of starts culminating towards the end where i just thought like oh a sugar Ray, like you have done it again uh because we suddenly get this really gorgeous glorious moment um where clara is obsessed with this idea that the sun is going to be the thing that's going to make josie better and so she thinks that there are various things that she needs to do to make that happen either um, you know, by opening all these windows and making sure that Josie has as much access to the sun as possible um, and it's kind of healing rays, um, but also uh, Clara's sort of absolute dedication to this idea that when the sun passes over the horizon, um, because when it goes out of sight, it goes out of sight behind a barn and Clara is convinced that that's where the sun goes to stop for the night and one of the most beautiful scenes i think for me that i've from in a very long time especially um in this year from this year i just think this was such a glorious gorgeous moment is where clara sort of fights tooth and nail to be able to get to this this place that she sees as the resting place of the sun and she is pleading with the sun to spare josie and to look after her and to heal her and clara this kind of robot I mean, this artificial friend who doesn't necessarily have human emotions in quite the same way is begging, she's praying. And there's this, this really strange thing where you've got a robot praying or, you know, like an artificial friend praying. It's a spiritual thing being done by a logical, man-made uh, sort of being that doesn't technically have a soul or isn't believed to sort of have a soul in that sense. And there's something so powerful about watching this you know, uh, Clara's absolute dedication and kind of determination to su to save Josie um, and doing everything she can and kind of being convinced that she's done it all wrong, that she's failed, that the sun went away and she didn't do what she needed to. And that kind of is a bit of a recurring theme through the book as well, this idea of hope um, and how hope is just such a powerful thing. And characters in the book really respond at first to Clara's sense of hope but then start to kind of think oh you know this isn't going anywhere you know we're not we're never going to make Josie better and it's amazing that the thing that brings hope is a robot or you know something artificial and not you know a human thing that, that hope feels like a very human um, emotion in some ways or a very living emotion it's not really something that you know you get necessarily from technology um, 
and that's just what I think is so stunning about it. There's this just this glorious moment where she, we are watching an artificial friend go through these motions, and we think it's, you know, it's pointless. And I think that's what's so tragic about that part of the book is this artificial friend is seeking hope and is really trying to do her best but at the same time we think well this is pointless it's sunlight this is what she thinks is going to do the do the deed um however i don't want to sort of spoil too too much about what comes next but it was just genuinely one of the most heartwarming moments in the whole book for me and one of the most heartwarming things i've read in a, a very long time i just and it's weird because you're reading this thinking i am absolutely cheering on uh, a piece of artificial, a fictional <laughs> artificial intelligence kind of creation um, and hoping that it can save this young girl's life. Um, and it's weird because again, I, I was really nervous going into this book that, you know, I've loved pretty much everything I've read of um, Ishiguro's. There's one book, I think maybe the, A Pale View of Hills, which I really enjoyed, but I didn't fully, fully love. Everything else I think I've pretty much fully loved. And I was worried this would be one of those books where I read it and think, oh, that was nice, that was good. Uh, but, uh, you know, I'm sort of missing something. And actually, I felt incredibly satisfied by this book. I just thought there was just so, so much that's beautiful and heartwarming and tender in this book. And it's so unexpected. I think that's what's so gorgeous about this. You do not see yourself at the beginning of the book feeling like you're going to feel. And um, it's just, it feels like such a you know, it's such a compulsive read. I just found myself wanting to go further and further with it. Um, I may stop there before I spoil anything else that comes later, but I really do urge you to check it out if you can, um, especially if you've really loved other uh, books by him. Um, you know, The Remains of the Day and Never Let Me Go are two of my favourites of his. Uh, when We Were Orphans, I also think is absolutely sublime. Um, and I'll, I'm going to do a video later this year sort of around his birthday, kind of looking at him as a sort of Booker Prize icon as well. Um, that said, we'll not be surprised if this makes the Booker a uh, long list at least. Um, not least as well for the reason that previous winners, you know, he won for the Reigns of the Day, previous winners um, automatically are allowed to have their books submitted, um, you know, by their publisher. So their publisher doesn't need to weigh up this versus something else, they can submit this and something else. Um, and so I would not be surprised if it makes it through. Anyway, all of that rambling aside, this is a glorious, glorious book. I'd really love to hear some of your um, opinions and views on it. I know that kind of, I tend to kind of, um, when I've really enjoyed a book or if I've not, if I've really not liked a book, if I've had quite a strong reaction either way, I quite like to read the Goodreads reviews for the opposite. Um, and some of the ones for the same opinion as me, <laughs> uh, to see kind of where I, you know, if I've missed anything or, or what other people are thinking on it. And it was really interesting with Clara and the Sun because some people, you know, quite a lot of people absolutely adored it. And a, a few people said, well, nothing happens. Um, or, you know, this is sort of standard sci-fi. And I think hopefully from what I've been saying um, in this video, hopefully you can see how I disagree with that in that I think quite a lot does happen. It's just very subtle. And I think it does do quite a lot um, within that trope and within that idea of artificial intelligence, um, but expands it. And that, I think that's what's so clever about this book for me, is it feels like it's taken something that could be so tired and old and injects something really quite profound and really quite beautiful into it. Um, so anyway, I will stop rambling there, but please do check out this gorgeous, gorgeous book. Um, and I really hope more people read it this year and have a great reaction. If you've already read it, let me know in the comments. Um, either way, whether you loved it or hated it or felt somewhat in the middle. And um, just as I'm saying this, the sun is coming out near me and refilling me with the kind of energy that Clara uh, craves throughout this book. So uh, I hope you've enjoyed this and take care. And um, yeah, we'll talk soon about more books. Take care. Enjoy your reading. Bye bye.